right. Well, thanks everybody for coming out here to uh, this session on how to run a successful influencer marketing campaign. My name is Adam Dolan. I'm the Director of Client Development at iAffiliate Management. We're an agency based out of uh, sunny Minneapolis, so it's always nice to come out to Vegas at this time of year. Uh, just real quick, um, looking at the agenda today, I've got Q&A slotted for the end here, but I think it's better to make these things a little interactive. So if you come up with any questions or anything you want to address during the course of the presentation, I think I'm happy to field that as we go. Just uh, it's important if you can step up to the mic that's in the center of the room so that we can capture everything on audio uh, for, the for those who aren't able to attend and for the that we're recording the session for. So uh, with that said, uh, let's go over the agenda for today's presentation. So it's a hot topic, uh, influencer marketing. The first thing I think it's important to get into is what is influencer marketing? Uh, this is gonna be kind of high level. Then we're gonna talk about planning your campaign, uh, uh, steps, what you need to look for when you're identifying influencers best practices and tools for recruiting influencers into your campaign, uh, measuring the success of your campaign, and then also the ever important compliance with any uh, rules and regulations. And for the folks who uh, came in at the end there, maybe before my introduction, I just mentioned, if you've got any questions as I'm going, feel free to hop in as we go. Just make sure you step up to the mic, okay? All right, uh, with that, let's answer the first question here. What is influencer marketing? Uh, I think a definition that I've seen that I really like to explain influencer marketing is that influencer marketing is a discrete form of marketing that utilizes tastemakers and thought leaders to carry your brand's message through social media and blogs. I think, I like that definition. I do think it's a little bit clinical though, and I think if we want to analogize it to something, influencer marketing is kind of like the cool kids when you're younger. What was, if you think about back to when you were little, what's a more effective way to get you to buy something? An advertisement or if the cool kids were using it? And essentially influencer marketing is the commercialized form of that. It's getting the cool kids, the popular people on the internet to carry your brand's message and ultimately influence that conversion, although there are certainly other goals that we can have with an influencer marketing campaign. Uh, as we've got here, uh, I've got in the uh, Venn diagram there, I've got the different forms of media that, uh, that exist and kind of where influencer marketing fits in. Influencer marketing is a, pay, it, it is a form of paid media. You're going to need to pay your influencers to get started. And we'll talk about what that looks like. But a, but a good influencer marketing campaign can bleed over into these, where these intersections exist. So a successful in influencer marketing campaign, which is paid, can move over to earned media, things like reposts, shares, and they can work with you on your owned media, things like your company's blog. So just keep that in mind as we're, go as we're going through the presentation, as this, that in a nutshell is what influencer marketing is. All right, so the first step in running a successful influencer marketing campaign is you need to plan your campaign. It sounds basic, but the old adage of fail to plan, plan to fail definitely applies when running an influencer marketing campaign. And the first step in planning is that you need to know your audience. This is if you're running it directly, you know, if you're an agency, then it's asking your client, what is your audience? And the questions you're asking them here are things like, who do you want to reach? Who's the target market for this message? You know, a good example is an influencer campaign that we've run like with a meal su delivery subscription service. The questions that we've asked the client are, who are, who are you trying to reach? Are you trying to reach busy parents who don't have time to cook after work? Are you trying to reach people who have never tried these services? Are you trying to reach people who are using a competitor's service and you want influencers to extol the benefits of your service? It's these type of questions. It doesn't necessarily have to be down to hard, fast, age, income, sex, demographics, but there needs to be some understanding of who you want to reach with the campaign. Simply starting it by saying, we want to reach influencers is going to be too broad and it's going to result in a very unfocused recruitment effort and a very unfocused campaign. Pardon me there. The next step here is that you need to set clear goals for your influencer marketing campaign. 
you need to, it's, it's, impo it, 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 it's, important to, it's important to define what success for the campaign is going to look like and to back up that success with measurable KPIs. You know, we're here at Affiliate Summit, so I think a lot of us are going to be approaching an influencer marketing campaign from the, fr from the mindset that we want to drive conversions. We want to drive revenue and we want to drive leads. But there are other goals that you can have for an influencer marketing campaign. For example, you might want to drive brand awareness. And if that's the case, then you want to look that you want to define your success and you want to define your KPIs in terms of things like brand mentions on social media. Or you might want to drive engagement with a particular piece of content or with the content that your influencers are writing so that, and if that's the case, then it's going to be looking at things like social media shares or blog post shares. And then finally, as I mentioned, you know, if we're approaching it as affiliate, mar as people who come from the performance marketing side, you know, if we're looking at conversions, then we want to see what the role of that influencer's post is in the overall conversion path. And then the final step in planning your campaign is that you need to allocate budget. There's no industry standard for how you pay for influencer marketing. Uh, what I've got here are roughly basically the three ways you're going to allocate your budget. Either it's going to be pay for post, it's going to be on a revenue share basis, or it's going to be in form of barter, in forms of either, to either goods or services. Setting a budget is really important because it, it helps you outline at the, out, at the outset what the scope of the campaign is and probably how successful you're going to be. You know, if you approach an influencer marketing campaign with, you know, tens, tens of thousands of dollars of budget to just get paid posts on the most highly targeted influencers, you're more likely to be, have a good chance of achieving the goals that you're outlining if you're coming at it where we don't really have any budget, we have a nominal rev share. Now, that's not to say that that campaign can't be successful, but it just helps set expectations either internally if you're the merchant running the influencer campaign or if you're running it on behalf of somebody setting expectations with that merchant as to what the limitations might be for the influencer marketing campaign. Once you've planned your campaign, then it's important to get into uh, identifying influencers, deciding who you want to go after first. This gets back to what I had on the previous slide, where you need to know your audience for the campaign. Just simply saying influencers is kind of a blanket term. It's just like using affiliates as a blanket term. Affiliates could mean anything. Well, influencers is maybe a little bit narrower than that. But there's a big difference between, say, like a social media celebrity like one of the Kardashians and a very targeted blogger talking about your, your particular market. So roughly the three things that you want to look for are reach, relevance, and engagement. So first things first, let's talk about reach. What is reach? Reach is basically the depth and breadth of this influencer's footprint in the space. So you're going to want to look at things like unique visitors for their blog, activity across multiple social channels, and things like that. There's a school of thought within influencer marketing that reach is actually the least important metric when you're looking, when you're looking for influencers, that relevance and engagement and a less is more philosophy is, are, actually the, are actually the more important things to look for when, when you're looking at influence, but reach is definitely one of the easier ones to come up with. Although uh, I've got unique visitors up here, it became a little bit more difficult after December 31st since Compete's public data is no longer available, but you, know, you can find, there are still ways of getting at this data. The next thing to look for when recruiting influencers is relevance. This is a bit softer when it comes to KPIs. You know, it's not going to be things like uh, unique visitors or the number of channels and social that they are active on. But it is the, it's asking, is the influencer's content and their quality right for your brand? And again, less is more when it comes to this. I think a good example would be, let's say, in our example, we have a high-end cutlery manufacturer and they want to run an influencer campaign. And, we have, and we're looking at two potential influencers. One of them is a blogger who you know, writes mostly about knives, about kitchen, about kitchen tools. And they, that person has 1,000 followers, so they've got a small reach. 
Conversely, you know, we could be looking at an influencer who just talks about cooking. Maybe they talk about cutlery sometimes, but it's more of a recipe blog. They've got a, they're better known. They've got a wider footprint. They charge more. In the case of the in the case of this campaign, there's a good chance you're better off working with the more targeted influencer because their audience is more dedicated to this particular subject matter. The what the influencer is talking about resonates with them. It's more authentic. And authenticity is really one of the key things to look for with influencer marketing. It's that the content that the influencer is creating is authentic. It resonates with the uh, it res it resonates with the uh, with the audience, and that gets to number three here, which is engagement. And you know, one of the schools of thought in, in influencer marketing is that engagement. That the engagement that an influencer drives is actually the most important thing to look for. And what you want to look for as barometers for if this, if this influencer can create engaging content are things like comments, quest if it's a blog post, for example, are there comments from the readers? Are there questions? Is there this back and forth? Are there reposts of this uh, on social media? Or is this just pretty content that comes up and really doesn't resonate with the readers of this of this blog, you know, it could have it could have a lot of impressions for one day. It has it has that reach, but it never really engages the user. And if it never engages the user, it's not really influencing the and it's not really influencing that end customer behavior. It's maybe not a very effective influencer. All right, once you've uh, once you've identified um, what you're looking for. <coughs> In your influencer. Now we're going to get into recruitment to uh, best recruitment uh, tools and best practices. So you've you've defined you you've planned your campaign. You know you know what you're looking for in your influencer. How are you going to find the influencer? And this is your influencers. And this can be a very time-consuming part of running an influencer marketing campaign. And it's very much dictated by the resources that you have. Going back to budget which we talked about at the top there. Uh, the first thing here is search engines. These are free. Everybody has access to them. So it is the literal pounding the pavement in Google, Bing, Yahoo. If you're looking primarily just for social influencers, it's pounding the pavement through Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. The plus here is, as I said, it's free. Everybody has access to these tools. The downside here is that it's incredibly manual, and you know you uh, may you may miss them. You may miss some things. The next uh, the next type of tool you can use to find influencers, uh, and there I'm not making any recommendations about any particular tools or methods uh, or any providers out here. Just kind of these are high level examples of generally what's available in the market. The next thing available that you have are databases. Databases are the next step up from just using the search engine and that they've done the searching for you. Uh, an example of that would be like a group high where it's scouring the internet, it's pulling information about bloggers, the posts that they're putting out there, it's getting contact information, their social footprint. They, some, of da some databases have some CRM type tools in there that can help you manage your communications with the, with the influencers. But uh, similar to you know, search engines, once you've found the influencers that you want to work with, you're going to be the one who has to own, uh, own the outreach. And, uh, and you're still going to have to do a bit of searching through the database. The next, uh, the next way you can find influencers would be through an influencer network. And an influencer network is different than a database in that they've already found the influencers for you. So you're working with a third party on behalf and who has a relationship with influencer with their influencers, knows them. They might specialize in a particular niche or vertical. Uh, the the benefit here is that it takes away a lot of that one to one contact that you would need to engage in when running an influencer campaign. You have somebody who's doing that on your behalf. You have a single point of contact as opposed to a thousand points of contact. Uh, but on the other hand here, you aren't going to have a direct relationship with your influencers. And so, you know, if that's important for you, that you really want to own those relationships, that's something that, may, that you won't necessarily have working with an influencer network. And then finally, uh, there's marketplaces. Marketplaces are kind of a hybrid 
between a network and a database. Uh, you're still going to, unlike a network, you're going to manage the relationships that you have with the influencers in here. Uh, but in the marketplace, as opposed to just being a raw data dump, there's, the influencers have been recruited in some sense, so they're, it's more of a warm lead. It's kind of the, if we were to analogize this to uh, you know, traditional affiliate marketing, it's the difference between searching for your affiliates just by going through the search engines or looking through like a network search feature. You know, if you're just getting your affiliates by, you know, hit, pounding the pavement, hitting up Bing and Yahoo, you're having to sell your affiliates on two things. One, affiliate marketing as a business model, and two, why they want to work with you. If you're using a network search feature, let's say I search, you know, I search through one of the affiliate networks, you at least have uh, some confidence that they're on board with the basic business model of affiliate, and then it's just a matter of if they want to work with you on the terms that you're offering. And that's kind of what the, that's what the marketplaces in the influencer space are providing too. You know, they may not agree with what you're, they may not want to promote your product, your payout may not be good enough, but in general, you know, they're, it's a warmer lead. All right. Once you've identified how you're going to be finding your influencers, then uh, I want to just talk about some best practices uh, when it comes to influencer recruitment tactics. Uh, key here, obviously, is to stay organized. So if you're working either with a client or working within your agency, a great, you know, great low-cost way to organize your, uh, your recruitment efforts is just to use a shared document. Use, you know, Google Docs is free or next to free, so even just a shared Google Sheet is one way that you can uh, keep track of that. And the things you're going to want to keep track of here is, you know, logical information, the name of the influencer, their contact information, all their social, all, all, all their social outlets, when you've contacted them, what rate you've offered them. Uh, if you have the resources, some people find it easier to use CRM tools. Uh, the plus with CRM tools is that they can handle some, is that you know, they're set up to manage some of these, to manage these relationships. They're pre-built that way on the down, and there are a lot of cheaper, and there are a lot of cheap ones available. So it really just kind of comes down to what you're comfortable with and what you want to, and, you know, and, and what makes sense for your budget and for your campaign. You know, if you're managing maybe 20, 30 influencers, having a full-fledged CRM to manage them is probably overkill. You know, if you've got uh, dozens of influencer campaigns with hundreds of potential influencers in them, then a single Google Sheet is probably going to be unmanageable. Uh, other things to keep in mind when you're recruiting influencers, and this is really important, is uh, the importance of an effective pitch. Um, I've got kind of the elements, what I think are the important elements of an effective pitch there, but the overriding thing uh, that you want to keep in mind and this is one of the first things I learned when I started working in affiliate, and it applies to influencer marketing, is when you're talking to them, talk to them like they're a human being. It's really important to talk to your influencers when you're reaching out as you would converse with another, hu uh, another human. Don't just bombard them with marketing speak or spammy outreach. That's going to be a very good way to turn them off at the outset. Uh, but anyway, so looking at an effective pitch, there's just a couple things here. It's uh, pretty common sense, but it's important that you have these things in here. So the first is a proper introduction. So this is just, you know, saying hello, first name, maybe use a title if it's appropriate, you know, if it's uh, somebody who seems like they are more prone to formalities, using their title would be appropriate. Uh, or if it, you know, culturally, if it would be better to. And then just uh, say who you are and uh, who you're reaching out on behalf of. So in this example here, I'm saying, hi, my name's Adam Dolan. I'm reaching out on behalf of the Acme Widget Company, who's running an influencer campaign. I'm not using some type of teaser introduction where it's, hello, would you like to be an overnight millionaire or something like that, something that would show up in my spam box as opposed to uh, like a legitimate business proposal. Uh, then move into the intention, which kind of overlaps a little bit with your introduction, but just tell them that, you know, Acme's running an influencer marketing campaign and we would love, uh, we'd love for you to participate. Then give them the details of what the campaign's going to look like so that, you know, you don't have to get into, this doesn't need to be, you know, a three-page white paper or anything for the internal marketing campaign, but just an overall idea of what the brand's looking to do, and they can decide, is this going to be a fit for what I do, you know? 
uh, it, you know, I'd, I highly recommend when you're reaching out to influencers pre-vetting this and making sure that your pitch makes sense for what they do. So, you know, if you're reaching out to a blogger who has no Instagram footprint and then talking to them about how you're running this killer Instagram campaign that just looks sloppy. It shows you don't really know them, you don't understand them, you haven't put any thought into this, you're just kind of shotgunning your recruitment out there. So, you know, make sure that the detail makes sense and that it, you know, if it, and even if it is a little attenuated, maybe you're asking them to step out a little bit of their comfort zone for what they do. If you make that known, you know, say, hey, you're really good at this, we'd like you to try a little bit of this, that's okay, but just let them understand that you that you've given this some thought. And then finally, uh, you know, finish off just with a call to action. So, okay, you've, you've piqued their interest, you've presented an effective pitch for, you, they know what the campaign's gonna be, what's the next step? Don't leave them hanging. So is this a, do they just get started right away? Do they email you? Just let them know. It's, it's not complicated, but just let them know what the call to action is here. All right. Next here is, uh, you know, you've recruit, we've, we've planned our campaign, we've identified our influencers, we've put together our document for tracking who we're reaching out to, we've recruited them, we have given them the product to talk about, now it is time to measure. And this gets back to uh, what we talked about in the planning stage, where different campaigns have different goals. And so, you know, you're gonna be looking at different things when you are, uh, you're gonna be looking at different key performance indicators depending on what the campaign goals are. So for instance, if we're looking, if we wanna, if the goal of the influencer campaign is to just to be driving raw site traffic, we're gonna look at metrics like clicks. Conversely, if the goal of our influencer campaign is we want to increase our brand's uh, fan base on social media, we wanna see, okay, post-influencer campaign, how many more followers do we have on Twitter? How many more followers do we have on Facebook? If we're really looking at like the quality of the campaign that the influencer is running, we want to measure social media shares. How many times this, po this, this blog post was reposted? Engagement, as we talked about, the key metric here, you want to look at what's happening on the post itself. So comments, questions, are, are users actually engaging with what the influencer has put out there into the world? And then finally, uh, e-commerce, which I imagine most of us are uh, interested in being in the performance marketing side, we're gonna wanna measure conversions here. So, and this may not necessarily work on a last click basis because a lot of influencers are going to exist at the top of the funnel. They're gonna exist at the discovery phase. And so we, you wanna be set up in your analytics platform to see, okay, at what stage in the conversion path was this influencer's content touched, if it was touched at all. All right, so this one, it's the less fun part of influencer marketing, but it is wholly essential. Um, we're gonna talk about FTC disclosure rules. Now, because we're here in Las Vegas, I'm just gonna talk about what's required in the US. I can't speak for uh, disclosure requirements for other countries, but if you're running an influencer marketing campaign, just be aware of whatever your local laws and regulations are regarding, influ regarding influencer marketing. So when we're talking about compliance, what are we talking about? We're talking about that, uh, that sponsored content call out, that requirement that when a blogger or social media personality is talking about a brand and they've been compensated for it, the FTC requires uh, that that uh, personality to make uh, to make that known, uh, and the rules and regulations for this in the U R in the U S are uh, that sponsored content uh, call out is required if it's either paid, so you know in the case of that upfront, or if it's uh, even if it's just an in kind transfer. So even if the influencer, it's just you gave them a product to review, the F T C according to their most recent publications would require that sponsored call out. Uh, it's, you know, it, most influencers at this point are aware of what the rules are with this, 
but it's just important to be proactive with this when you're working with them. So if it's somebody who's inexperienced during your outreach and getting them up and going, just make it known that one of the requirements for our campaign is that you comply with any, any rules and regulations because the FTC really does impute responsibility for this to the brand, not to the influencer. And while it can certainly be a pain in the butt to comply with, it's a lot better to tell an influencer who won't participate, no, I can't work with you because you're not going to do this, as opposed to getting caught and having to deal with the fallout of not properly complying with the rules. And then as far as what we've got for uh, requirements, it needs to be clear and conspicuous. Uh, you know, with bloggers, it's per, you know, the sponsored content above the uh, above the content is typically what uh, what's seen. Uh, social media, you know, Twitter. There's certainly a limitation because it's 140 characters. But I believe the hashtag ad or hashtag paid or spo hashtag sponsored is considered acceptable. Um, you know, in working with influencers, they re it's really important they need to avoid false claims. And so, you know, if you've paid them and they don't like the product, they need to say that. They can't, you know, if they, if they got a review copy, they need, to be, they need to be open about that. And then penalties for this uh, are civil penalties. It can, and it can involve monetary fines and it can involve uh, monitoring of future marketing campaigns by the FTC, which I think that sounds like about the worst thing to have to deal with in your day to day. So again, just better to be uh, upfront with your influencers and making sure that they're in compliance. So. Uh, so we're kind of getting towards the end here. So just to recap, um, what's influencer marketing? Influencers are thought leaders and tastemakers who uh, you leverage through paid media to carry your brand's message. Uh, it's important to define clear goals and metrics prior to identifying and recruiting influencers. Uh, traditional affiliate marketing metrics, you know, may not always be the best. Uh, and by this, I'm saying, you know, it's what I was talking about earlier. If you're looking at things just purely on a rev share, on a on a conversion basis, you know, social is top of the social blog can be top of the funnel. It may not necessarily be driving that conversion. So, trying to measure brand awareness uh, backed out into ROI, it, it just it's difficult. And then finally, compliance is important. So familiar yourself, familiarize yourself with either what the FTC says or what your local re laws and regulations are just to make sure you don't get into trouble. Uh, and with that, uh, we've got a few minutes left. So if anybody has any questions, just feel free to uh, step up to the microphone. Oh, uh, sure. I'll let you, I'll let you both de uh, determine who goes first. Um, hey, thank you for the presentation. You're welcome. Um, my question is, um, I know you talked about compliance, so how, what are some tips to kind of um, monitor um, how the influencer is presenting um, our products and services? Sure, so it's depending on what, uh, depending, I think the question is uh, tips on monitoring compliance. It depends on what your bandwidth is. So, you know, you might be using a tool that is going to pull in some of the data about the, about the posts that the influencer is putting up. Ideally, uh, in the case of at least blog posts, you know, you're going to see it before it goes up. But it's, real, it's really just a matter of, um, you know, one, accurately cat cataloging who you're working with, right? So knowing what's out there that's promoting your brand so that you can audit it. Uh, if you have the tools that pull some of this in, um, that's all the better, but it can be a manual process. So. Go ahead, sir. All right, Adam. So on the email acquisition part, yes, where you send an email, I've tried long emails and mm -hmm. short ones, and I found that usually it's dudes that reply back, but if I'm targeting a uh, female, the response rate is tremendously lower, even if it's the same message. And I'm working in health products. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious if you know a means to A-B test that more efficiently since the sample size is low, and suggestions on a intro letter to get a stronger callback mm -hmm. and a reply. Sure. So the question is, we're talking about your actual recruitment of influencers, right? That's Not correct. Emails. Okay. 
and, you're, and the question is, you've tried some long emails, you've tried some short emails, uh, and you're wondering what the, you know, what you can do to better test that. Uh, have you been, you know, how much are you experimenting with the copy and the calls to action in there? Uh, I'm fairly, it's unique and personalized for each of them. Sure. For the most part. And... I get good responses from a certain demographic. Okay. But not another one. So I'm curious to know if there's a way to better leverage that. Yeah, no, I think that sounds like a pretty specific to your campaign. So I'd be happy to talk to you on that after, but I think it gets I think it sounds like it's pretty nuanced to your particular uh recruitment efforts there. So mm -hmm. I think it's very there are a lot of details. Yeah, I know one thing that we found with our agency sometimes that makes a big difference is actually who the sender is. Um, just, and that might, and it might be that, uh, you know, we've actually, you know, had better luck with uh, some of our more junior staff uh, sending out the uh, communications. And I don't know if that's the readers are checking them out on social media and find that more interesting, if it's the name or what have it. But that might be one thing you can experiment with too, is just different email aliases, or if you have different people within your organization. So, But there's a lot of variables there, so I'd want to talk to you about that specifically, just because I think uh, I think that it, we'd have to get into the details. So. All right, thank you. Thanks. And it looks like I'm getting the time there, but... Uh, how you doing? Just a quick one. Sure. If, if you were work, if you were able to work out something with an influencer, um, and you worked some relationship out, say on a CPA basis, where you know they would get paid on conversions to your site. Mm -hmm. What tracking would you? How would you establish tracking with them? I mean, sure. It it kind of depends on uh, kind of getting back to your resources. If you've got a viable affiliate program, use your affiliate tracking. Uh, if you don't have an affiliate program, look at like one of the off-the-shelf uh, tracking platforms that doesn't have all the features of an affiliate program. So it may not. It would be reporting only. It would be tracking and reporting only, but it's not going to have the payment features. Um, and if it's somebody who really trusts you, they are willing to work off your analytics data. So it uh, it really depends on kind of what the influencer is game for. All right. Well, thanks everybody. Appreciate you coming out to the session. Uh, I don't have anything booked immediately afterwards, so if you have any questions at all, uh, I'll be around.